from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the following is provided by the West Virginia Department of Education and West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Hey! Hey everyone, it's Education Station, the show where we invite teachers from all across West Virginia to submit videos of themselves teaching their favorite lessons. In today's episode, we've got three exciting lessons about shapes, reading, and the great outdoors. Well, hello and welcome back, everyone. I'm your host, Alex Milanese, and we're kicking off today's episode with an exciting lesson about 2D and 3D shapes. Now, we all use shapes every day to help us describe the world around us, and so Ms. Puglesi is going to help us compare 2D and 3D shapes. Let's check it out. Hi, boys and girls. My name is Mrs. Puglisi, and today I'm going to be teaching a lesson on shapes. The first shapes we're going to talk about are called 2D shapes. 2D shapes have two things that we have to count on them. The first aspect of the shape we will count is called the sides. So this is a side. Let's count them together. Are you ready? There's one, two, three, four. Four sides. Where the sides meet at this point is called a vertice. Let's count those. Ready? There was one, two, three, four. So we have four sides and four vertices. This kind of shape is called a quadrilateral with four sides and four vertices. Now, you might be thinking, well, this looks like a square. Well, it is. A square is a special kind of quadrilateral that has all equal sides and what we call a right angle, okay? But this shape, which you also might be familiar with, is also a quadrilateral because it also has the four sides and the four vertices. And do you know what this shape is called? A rectangle, okay? Quadrilaterals can be any of the four sides and vertices, so they don't just have to be the square or rectangle either. They could look something like this, or this, okay? So any way that we count those, they have four sides and four vertices, okay? Can you think of any objects around your house that have four sides and four vertices? Look around, do you see anything? Is the television or computer screen you're watching, does it have four sides and four vertices? What about a piece of paper that you use to write on? Okay, can we count those? One, two, three, four, and one, two, three, four, okay? So I want you to look and see around your house if you can find any quadrilaterals after you're done watching this. Let's talk about another shape. Let's count the sides of this one, ready? There's one, two, three sides, and one, two, three, vertices. An object with three sides and vertices is called a triangle. Do you think you could find any triangle shapes around your house? We're going to talk about one more. So this shape has one, two, three, four, five sides and one, two, three, four, five vertices. So a shape with five sides and vertices is called a pentagon. 
So, so far we've learned about three shapes. We've learned about this one with three sides and vertices and it was called a triangle. We've learned that any shape with four can be a quadrilateral and they're special quadrilaterals called squares and rectangles. And we learned about a five side and vertice shape, and that is called a pentagon. Now that we've learned about two dimensional shapes, we're going to learn about three dimensional shapes. We have to count three things on a 3D shape. So let's start with this, okay? So you notice, unlike my other shapes, this has what we call faces. So this might look like a rectangle, but look, if I turn it, there's more rectangles. And this part right here looks like a square, right? So these flat places are called faces, okay? And I have to count all the faces of this 3D shape. So we'll start one, two, three, and look, there's one on the back here, four, and then we have five, six. So this has six faces. And then we have to count these. They kind of look like the sides, right? But we call those the edges on a 3D shape. So there's one, two, three, four, but I can't stop there, right? I have to count all of them. So if I would count all the way around and my tops and bottoms, I would get 12. There's 12 edges on this 3D shape. Now remember on our 2D, we counted the vertices. This also has vertices. It's where the edges meet those points, okay? So let's count those. There's one, two, three, four. Count the other one, five, six, seven, eight. So there are eight vertices on this, not just four, okay? That's what makes it 3D. It has faces, edges, and vertices. This particular 3D shape is called a rectangular prism, okay? This 3D shape, it looks like the rectangular prism, but you'll notice that all of these edges are of equal length and all my faces are the same size. This is called a cube. Now, if a 3D shape has no faces, no sides, no vertices, we call it a sphere. Looks like a ball, right? That's a sphere. Can you think of a 2D shape that also has no sides or vertices? That would be a circle, right? Okay. I'm gonna talk about two more 3D shapes. This one's called a cylinder. It has two faces that look like circles. Okay, but you'll notice it can roll back and forth in my hand. Similar to a sphere, it has no edges and no vertices. Let's look at one more. This is called a cone. It has one face and it has one vertice too. But you'll notice here, there's no edges, right? It can just roll around. So now my challenge for you at home is can you find any 3D shapes? For example, this tissue box. What kind of shape is this? Here's an example of a real life rectangular prism. How about my container here? It's got two round faces, no edges or vertices. Here's an example of a cylinder. Good luck finding them around your house. Bye. Thanks, Ms. Paglesi. All right, now, thankfully, school is back in session, but did you know that sometimes puppies also go to school? Well, in our next segment, Mrs. Milanese is going to read us a book about a dog that goes to school. Let's check it out. Hello, everyone. My name is Alicia Milanese, and today I'm going to be reading you a story. I found this story on an app called Epic. 
Epic is a free app that you can download onto a phone, tablet, or iPad, and there are tons of stories to choose from. I chose a really cool one for us today, so let's check it out. Today's book is from the Ick and Crud series. This one is called Ick and Crud, First Day of School. The author is Wiley Blevins, and the illustrator is Jim Paolot. Meet the characters. Crud, Ick, Miss Puffy, Bob, and Mrs. Martin. This chapter is titled, A Brilliant Idea. Where's Bob going? asked Ick. He's grabbing our leashes, said Crud. And you know what that means. Yes, said Ick. It's time to take Bob for a walk. Where will we go this time? asked Crud. Bob likes the lake, said Ick. Not after you pushed him in, said Crud. He looked hot, said Ick. Well, what about the park? We can't go there. Remember the squirrel attack? Putting nuts on Bob's hat was a bad idea. Bob's not easy to walk, said Ick. No, he isn't, said Crud. But we must. He needs the exercise. Ick and Crud yapped at Bob, and Bob snapped on their leashes. Hurry, Bob, they barked. Ick and Crud led him onto the sidewalk. Crud lapped up the fresh air. Ick hopped. He rolled in the leaves. He sneezed and barked at a butterfly. Then he suddenly stopped and looked up. Mrs. Martin was peeking over the fence. Where is you-know-who? asked Ick. Don't ask, said Crud. Miss Puffy hopped onto the fence. She licked her paws like they were lollipops. Hello, boys, she purred, out for a stroll. Do you think she sees us, asked Ick. I don't think so, said Crud. Just keep moving. He tugged his leash to the right. Ick tugged to the left. Come on, Bob. Oh, look, said Miss Martin. Those two sure have a hard time on a leash. You know what they need? What? asked Bob. They need to go to school. Bob nodded. That's a brilliant idea. Miss Puffy hissed a laugh. School, said Ick. I'm not going to school. Me either, said Crud. In school, they make you sit and roll over and play dead. Yeah, said Ick, and play dead. He shivered thinking about it. No way, no how, not going to go. And as far as he was concerned, that was that. Strike one, chapter two. The next morning, Bob set out two small crates. He tossed a bone into each crate. Uh-oh, warned Crud. Don't fall for that again. But before he finished, Ick was already inside, gnawing on the bone. Crud rolled his eyes. Fine, he said. To doggy school we go. But there better not be homework. And in he waddled. A big sign hung outside the school. Bob carried Ick and Crud inside. The teacher greeted them. His face was round and flat, his nose barely there. He looked like a bulldog, said Ick. Don't insult our bulldog friends, whispered Crud. The teacher pointed to the line on the floor. It ran from one end of the room to the other. What are we doing? asked Ick. The teacher's making us sit on the line, said Crud. Does it hurt? asked Ick. It's not electric, said Crud. Just sit. Ick stood in front of the line and sniffed. He stood behind the line and sniffed. Then he stood over the line and wiggled his butt. Plop. Ah, that's better, he said. But where is Bob going? Bob and the other humans walked to the opposite side of the room. The teacher stood beside them. As soon as he raised his hand, the room filled with their dog, with dog names. Fifi and Fido, Santa Paws, Sir Barks a Lot, come, 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 they shouted the humans. Bob yelled, come Crud, come Ick. Ick sat and tilted his head. Crud licked his paw. 
We're so much smarter than those other dogs, said Crud. Look at how they run. They'll never train their humans that way. Bob jumped up and down. He flapped his arms. Come, Crud. Come, Ick, he screamed. This is fun, said Ick. Look at Bob go. He's try is he trying to fly? I think he's trying to dance, said Crud. Should we go to him? I will if you will, said Ick. Just wait, said Crud. Let's see what else we can get Bob to do. Bob jumped higher. He yelled louder. He waved his arms faster. His face turned a sunny red. All the dogs sat quietly by their humans and watched, but Ick and Crud. They stayed on the line. Crud rolled on his back and let out a moan. Ick licked the floor. The teacher pointed at Ick and Crud. Strike one. Chapter three, strike two. What's next? asked Ick. This is fun. Maybe magic tricks, said Crud. Look. One at a time, each human lowered his or her hand and said, stay. Then the human started yelling a string of words. Shoe, sun, pencil, book. The human's dog stayed on the line. Good boy, said the teacher to the dog. A well-trained dog only comes when he hears his name. Then it was Bob's turn. He slowly lowered his hand. He looked into Ick and Crud's eyes. Stay, he said. Good boy, Bob, said Ick. He learns fast. Just wait, said Crud. Bob took a deep breath and he yelled, Shoo, stick, pickle. Pickle, said Ick. Does Bob have a pickle? Yum, said Crumb. And the two raced across the room, jumping into Bob's arms. The teacher frowned. Strike two, he said. Chapter four, strike three. That was fun, said Ick, but next time there better be a pickle. Bob picked up Ick. He took him to the teacher. The teacher unwrapped a small purple sheet. This shows how smart your dog is, he said. It takes most dogs only two to three seconds to get out from under it. Bob gently placed the sheet over Ick. Oh, how warm, said Ick. He wiggled under the sheet, then he sniffed the floor. I smell you, Crud, he barked. Here I come. He waddled over to him. Crud crawled under the sheet to join Ick. Within seconds, both were curled up and snoring. Strike three, moaned the teacher. Bob plopped on the floor beside Ick and Crud. Seriously, guys, he said. What was that? Ick peeked out from under the sheet. He leaned his head into Bob's leg. Poor Bob, said Ick. He's not so good at school. Chapter 5, The Big Test. Okay, class, said the teacher. Here's the big test for today. Put your dog on the line. The humans did as they were told. They looked nervous. All the dogs sat. A few wiggled and wagged. Ick rolled his eyes. They do whatever their humans say. Yeah, said Crud. Will they ever learn? It's the humans that need to be trained, and it takes time. Now, whispered the teacher, make your dog stay seated for one minute. Any dog who can sit that long passes the test. I like to sit, said Crud. I can sit all day, said Ick, and he started to lick the air. The humans kneeled low to the floor. Chants of stay, stay, stay filled the room. Bob looked at Ick and Crud. Sweat dripped down his face. Stay, please, he pleaded. Please stay. You don't have to ask me twice, said Ick. He rolled over and stared at the ceiling. Crud rolled beside of him. Just then, Mrs. Martin walked outside the class window. On her shoulder sat Miss Puffy. She swished her tail from side to side and she hissed and icked at Crud, at Ick and Crud. All the dogs shot across the room. They banged against the window, growling and barking. Miss Puffy arched her back and hissed some more. Ick and Crud didn't move. Not a foot, not an inch, not even an eensy weensy centimeter. If they only knew her, said Ick. Yeah, they would have stayed with us, said Crud. The teacher handed Bob a certificate. It had a big gold star on it. I don't know how, he said, but Ick and Crud passed the test. Good luck with them. He shook his head and walked away. Are you ready to go home? asked Crud. I am, said Ick. All this schooling is giving me a headache. Bob's not easy to train. I wonder what we can teach him next, asked Crud. 
hold the doggy door, said Ick. Maybe we can teach Bob to fetch balls and sticks and lots of food. Good idea, buddy, said Crud. Let's go home and get started. Thanks, Mrs. Milanese. Now, for our final segment today, we're going to visit Miss Sinisi, who has an awesome lesson about temperate, deciduous forests. Let's check it out. We talked about the desert biome, places where people, where people live, animals live, plants grow. And today we're going to look at where we live here in West Virginia. It's called the temperate deciduous forest, or sometimes you might see it called the broadleaf forest. Talking about deciduous and broadleaf are both talking about the types of trees. We'll look at it here in a minute. Deciduous forest grows in areas where there are four clear seasons, uh, winter, spring, summer, and fall. Most of the eastern half of the United States is in the same biome. And then if we look around the globe, so much of, of central and northern Europe, eastern China and Japan, those would all be temperate deciduous forests. Here are some of the key characteristics. We have long, warm growing seasons. So we would look from spring into, into summer into fall. We have a long period of growth before the leaves start to change, and we'll talk about that in a minute. There's a lot of moisture, high amount of rainfall, right? Rich soil that's provided by the leaves dropping from the trees. Uh, when the leaves start to change color and then they die, they lose their chlorophyll, they drop to the ground, that dead leaf cover is called detritus, and uh, many species live in that detritus, and they function as decomposers. So they break those dead leaves down so we can get the nutrients in the soil from them, which gives us rich soil to grow the plants in. Um, stuck here. Um, the tree leaves are arranged in strata meaning like when we talked about rock, we talked about the strata of rock in different layers. That's what strata means. So at the top, you have the canopy, right? Like kind of a canopy bed that goes over top. And then the understory, the next trees down, and then little shrubs, and then things that go on the ground. So if we look at that as in layers, we can think about the sun at the top. And so those canopy trees get the most sun, and it filters out some, which then the understory filters out even more, and then the shrubs, and then the ground. So a great deal of light is filtered out before the light reaches the ground. Um, trees will stop photosynthesizing and enter a dormant period during the cold months. Um, the average daily temperatures in the temperate deciduous forest is between negative 22 and 86, which this has changed a little bit, but our yearly average temp is around 50 degrees Fahrenheit and about 30 to 59 inches of rain a year, which is a, a lot of rain. Yes, last on the last lesson we talked about adaptations, and I wanted to look again about adaptations. Remember, those are those evolutionary constructs that help things to be able to survive. So um, deciduous leaves drop, right? They lose, trees lose their leaves. If we look at coniferous trees or conifers, those are the ones that have needles, right? So these have leaves instead of needles, and you can go outside and look and see that for yourself. If you look at an oak tree, a maple tree, whatever type of tree, those have leaves that they're gonna lose um, during a period of time in the year, not needles like you would on a pine tree. We talked about stomata the last time. Those are those little openings on the bottoms of the leaves that allow for the gas exchange between carbon dioxide and oxygen. Um, also, we have flowers that develop um, to seeds, right? We have little seeds within flowers, and you have pollen within the flowers and things like that um, in, in just one season. So we don't have to wait. We have a flower that goes to a seed that the next season will grow again into a flower, right? Those are um, some examples would be like acorns. You've seen acorns or chestnuts. Those are just big seeds if you see an acorn or a chestnut. And then those little winged seeds, sometimes you see them. They're called akines, but you see them in the uh, flying around little helicopters little kids call them uh, when the cold season arrives the chlorophyll is broken down so no more green in the leaves right at the when, when it starts to get cold and that's what that's what determines when the the leaves change the temperature a lot of people think it just occurs in the fall well it depends on when the temperatures start to cool down so um, that that's broken down and the waste products that you get from the decomposition of the chlorophyll uh, remain to color the leaves. Those things are called accessory pigments. There are things like carotenoids, the same pigment that makes a pumpkin orange, or the xanthophylls, those make them red. And there's different types of those that allow for the leaves to change color. And then when those finally leave, they die and fall off of the tree. Some 
trees have adapted strategies that are similar to the conifers, to the pine trees, right? Um, they're green all year long, and what allows them to stay green is they have sort of a waxy coating on their leaves and fewer stomata on the bottom of their leaves, less um, exchange of the gas, the carbon dioxide, and the oxygen. Um, we do have conifers in most temperate forests. They're just not the most abundant trees. But the advantage of that is the needles protect against the cold and they can protect against drought. So we're looking at those are some of the uh, adaptations to those different types of trees. Um, the animals also have adaptations. Hibernation is an adaptation for these animals to be able to survive the cold weather. If you're in the desert, it never gets cold. You don't have to hibernate. But here, certain mammals will have to hibernate, right? They live in burrows or caves. So in the, um, during the winter time when it's cold outside and they accumulate a bunch of fat like bear, a bears will go and eat and eat and eat and eat, um, sometimes tens of thousands of calories a day to get all that body fat. So when they go into that dormant state, then they can live off of that body fat, the accumulation of body fat. Or some animals also will start storing food in the summertime and hide it away in their burrows. So when they're in there during the winter time, they have something to eat. That's an adaptation, right? Because they would die if they couldn't do that. Uh, we also have what are called mutualistic relationships. Mutualism is something like that it can be positive or negative like parasitism things like that but in this instance this is beneficial for both of, the, of them. So animals will help to spread the seeds of plants right? Uh, animals might run through the forest and as they run around they will pick up a seed, um, uh, squirrels and acorns. They pick them up, they may carry it to another tree and drop it elsewhere. That helps the plants to be able to disperse, right? And in turn um, they live off of the fruits, the bark, and the leaves. So those animals may eat those fruits right? And you get seeds in the fruit, they can't digest them. So when they um, eliminate that from their body, the seeds are in that and then they spread that around as well. Um, animals in turn can be kept um, from eating too much of those plants and getting sick, which would kill the animal, right? And they have defenses such as thorns. You've all seen thorns like on a rose bush. Thorns are one of the adaptations of plants to keep the animals from eating them. We talked about the cactus and the needles. Um, or toxic chemicals. Some plants produce toxic chemicals, just like fungi. Some fungi produce um, hallucinogenic chemicals, toxic chemicals, and things like that that would keep those animals from eating that certain amount. You should never go out into the forest and pick something and just eat it if you don't know what it is, because it could contain a toxic chemical that you don't know would hurt you. So we're going to look at some pictures and a little bit of video that goes along with the temperate deciduous forest, and we would love for you to give the video a thumbs up and share it with your friends. Thanks, Ms. Sinisi. All right, well, that wraps up everything for us here today on Education Station. We want to thank everyone who shared their awesome lessons. And we want to thank you for watching. We'll see you next time right here on Education Station.